All right. How was everybody's weekend? Amazing. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. All right. So we are closing in on the midterm. Midterms a week from tomorrow. What? Week from tomorrow. Okay. So the practice midterm is available right now. If you go to Canvas, um, you can you can look at the practice midterm. It'll be the exact same format. It's a lot of the same, a lot of stuff we spent some time on. Um, and hopefully on Friday, all we will be doing is going over doing review stuff, just talking about the practice test. I'll answer questions from you on whatever you want more practice on. If you want to just do practice on Vesper geometries and Lewis dot structures all day on Friday, I'm just going to take questions and we're going to just work on what people ask me about. So yes. we don't have school Friday. So that would be on Monday then, um, which actually makes more sense anyway, given that Tuesday is the test. So the one that the other aspect of that is like I mentioned before, we're gonna split up the test in two days so that there's a little bit less time pressure. I'm used to two hour lecture period at the college. You don't have two hour lecture periods here. So the the um, exam is built around being able to finish it in two. I usually take people that are prepared an hour to an hour and a half, but I also want to accommodate for the fact that not everybody takes tests quickly, even if you do the lecture period. So what we'll do is next Tuesday and Thursday, you probably questions one through six on Tuesday, four through 10, uh, or sorry, um, whatever's left, seven through 10 on Wednesday. And then I'll grade them, get back to you, um, which means you won't have the midterms on, your midterm grade on your midterm high school transcript grade, right? But we talked about that last week. Um, if your final grade in the class is higher than what you have input for your midterm, let me and Tom's know during finals week, and we, we will fill out the paperwork necessary to do that. We've done that in the past. It's it's not that big of a hassle. It's extra paperwork that we would like to avoid, but we were more than willing to do that, um, especially since we are on such a unique schedule um, for this class compared to the rest of the SDHS. All right, so any questions about that right now? Your assignment tomorrow will be to work on the practice test. We will have a, a um, computer-based lab, one more computer-based lab before we get back to lighting stuff on fire. Um, we'll be on Thursday. It's gonna be practice with the Vesper geometries and drawing Lewis dot structures. So that'll be good practice studying for the test as well. Lila? And you do have the polyatomic ion quiz tomorrow as well. So when you're done with the polyatomic ion quiz, you're just working on the practice test, okay? Um, the key for the practice test, I'll I'll make sure I link it. It'll be it'll go live probably on on Thursday, so that you have Thursday to look over the key and compare it to your answers. I want you to try the practice test on your own before I give you the key, just like the nomenclature one. Questions on that? All right. Actually, now that I think about it, the key will go live probably midnight on Thursday because I don't want you working on that when you're supposed to be doing your best for geometry lab. Just midnight, just because that's the default time. I want it to be, I want you to have access to the key after you're done with the class on Thursday so that you have time to work on the lab without being distracted. Does that seem reasonable? I'm open to having my mind changed on that. So I feel strongly about that one way or the other talking after class. All right, then let's do some more stoichiometry. Remember how stoichiometry wasn't actually so bad when we didn't call it stoichiometry? It's just more conversions, that's all it is. And there are even a whole number of conversions. So that's what we're gonna work on today. And then we'll talk a little bit about reaction types. Um, and, uh, and the reaction types will likely not be on the midterm but it'll be on the final. So we're kind of drawing the line. Stoichiometry is gonna be about, is the last thing that we're covering now that'll be on the midterm.
All right. So we'll start with a reminder. I already said it once. Polyatomic ions quiz tomorrow. Let's start by balancing reactions because we can't do stoichiometry if we don't have reactions balanced, right? We need conservation of mass to be held up by our chemical reactions or else stoichiometry doesn't work. So let's practice balancing some, some equations first. And I'll give you a head start on these. First one might be the trickiest one we've done so far, right? Because you have chlorine showing up in two different products. Or is it? Does it actually work out pretty good? <laughs> Connor, you nodded. I'm going to put you on the spot. What did you do to? Added two HCl. And how did you know to do that? There's two hydrogens on the other side, so. We have water as a reactant, right? So that means we have to be making at least two HCLs on this side. So we start by taking care of that. Excellent work, Connor. That takes care of everything else all of a sudden, right? One oxygen on both sides, five chlorines on both sides, one phosphorus on both sides. Sometimes it looks a little bit more intimidating, but if you actually start working your way through it, it's not so bad. Wait, uh, so Jesse. Three or five, because So this is actually kind of a fun reaction. Um, you take a copper penny, if you drop it in concentrated nitric acid, it dissolves. It gives off a really bad smelling red gas and the solution turns bright blue because copper ions are blue. How are we gonna balance this though? We have nine oxygens on the right already. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? But then, then we wind up with an odd number of hydrogens on the left. So that takes care of the oxygens. But then we wind up with an odd number of hydrogens and an even number of hydrogens over here. So we know that can't be. So what could we do? What did we do with the oxygen in the combustion reactions, right? When we had the odd even issue, we doubled everything, right? So if we double this to a six, that's gonna mean, and then we're gonna try doubling everything with an oxygen in it, I guess. I don't know what, is we have to have a three here then, right? How 
how many nitrogens? We've got, where do we go from here? We're not there yet for sure, right? Hydrogens are taken care of, oxygens are not yet. I guess we didn't finish doubling these other things, but let's count oxygens first. 18 oxygens here. Three times two is six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So that's not gonna work, or at least not as it is. What if instead of doing doing six over here, what if we just worried about the hydrogens first? What if we just did that? Now all of a sudden we've got, and that can't work either, why not? Uh, nitrogens too, right? So we also have the nitrogens, although we can just put, there's at least three nitrogens over here. So we've got to have at least three here. So two didn't, one didn't work, two didn't work. Six might have worked, but it looked really complicated. So three is not going to work because we got the odd number of hydrogens again. So let's try four and see what four does. We do four. Get a two there. What if we just made up the difference in the nitrogens by putting a two there. Now we've got four nitrogens and four nitrogens. Did that make, and we've got our ox or our hydrogens taken care of. What about our oxygens? We've got 12 oxygens. Here we've got six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That would work, right? So these are, it's not truly guess and check. It feels like guess and check sometimes, but it's a it's a, a logic puzzle. And some of these can be, I, I won't give you one that's this tough to balance on the midterm. But what you have to do is to start going through the possibilities like we did out loud. We knew this couldn't be a one because we had to have at least two hydrogens for water. Then it couldn't be a two because that wasn't enough nitrogens. Then it couldn't be a three because we need an even number of hydrogens. And then we got four. We looked at four, stuff started falling into place. Again, there is a mathematical way to solve this if you write an algebra expression for every single element. Um, you can use linear algebra to solve for that and you get a system of equation. You can do substitutions. You can solve it analytically. It doesn't have to be guess and check like this. But again, unless you get a particularly complicated one like this, it, that's pretty much overkill. Almost, actually, I think I can say uh, with uh, certainty, I have never in my career as a student or as a working chemist or as a teacher felt the need to use um, a system of equation to balance a reaction. That's never once come up um, for me personally. The math teachers at the college keep asking me for good complicated um, reactions so that they can teach it as, as linear algebra actually has a, a practical use. Um, and I don't have a good example because it just doesn't come up that much. All right, from that one to one that's considerably simpler. Put a two on the right. Got two hydrogens and two iodines. Iodines are already in the right proportion. And you get two hydroiodic acids. And then last but not least, Fe, iron plus oxygen. Odd number of oxygens over here, right? So we got to start by doing a two there at least. That take, and then that means we need a three here. Now oxygens are counted for. We can add however many hydrogens we want. What reaction is this? Anybody know? Oxidation of 
of iron. This is iron rusting. So when you leave your cheap metal objects out all winter in the backyard, maybe that's less you and more just my kids that leave random random crap in the backyard under the snow all winter. And we come back and it's all rusted out. That's what's going on. All right, any questions on balancing? Easy enough as long as I don't give you a tricky one, right? Let's look at this iron oxide one as a little bit of review for stoichiometry. And I'll rewrite it up so we have room to work here. 4Fe plus 3O2 goes to 2 iron 3 oxide. If I started with a cheap metal toy that was, let's say it's, I don't know, 100 grams, 100.0 grams, and it completely rusts over the course of the winter, how much is that object going to weigh in the, in the springtime when it's fully rusted? Mm -hmm. All the iron is converted to iron three oxide. In other words, if 100 grams of iron oxidizes, how many grams of iron oxide can be produced? No. Remember the, the acetylene example? It's not always, it's we have, we, are bound by conservation of mass, but we've got the mass of oxygen act reacting too, right? So our total mass is gonna, at the end, is gonna be the mass of the iron and the mass of the oxygen that reacts. So it won't be the same amount. It'll be the same number of moles of iron before and after, but it won't be 100 grams. How do we go about doing this? find the amount of grams of oxygen, then we can just add them up. That's one way to do it. We're going to do it that way, though. There's a shortcut. If we just figure out how many moles of iron we start with, we can figure out how many moles of iron three oxide we're going to make because it's going to be in that two to one ratio, right? If we know how many moles of iron three oxide we make, we can just use the molecular weight to get to grams. So our, our roadmap is going to be grams of iron to moles of iron. Once we know how many moles of iron we have, we can say, okay, every time four moles of iron reacts, it makes two moles of product. And then once we get moles of product, we can use the molecular weight to get to grams of product. Which step here is stoichiometry? We're going to use that word. Well, Only one of these steps is. This step right here, where we use that mole to mole ratio. All it is, is if we have a balanced reaction, it's just a matter of saying two moles of iron makes, or four moles of iron makes two moles of iron oxide. And just representing that as a ratio, as a conversion. What are we using for this first step? Grams to moles. 100 grams, yes. And then we're going to say grams to moles. So we say, okay, if we have 100.0 grams of iron, every, I think it's, is it 
every 55.845 grams of iron, not fluorine, is one mole of iron. So anytime you've got one of these stoichiometry problems, I'm on tests especially, I'm always going to write them out like this. Here's your, it might not be balanced, but I'm always going to be, here's your reaction. I'm going to say, here's what you know. And I'll say, this is what you're trying to calculate. Anytime you see that, your first thought should be to get everything that you have into moles. Because once we're in moles, we can do that mole to mole ratio to get to our other substance. So what's the next thing I'm going to write here? The mole ratio. But go go the way you were going. Four, four more of iron to every two moles of iron. We want moles of iron to cancel out. So moles of iron goes on bottom. Moles of product goes on top. And then we're just going to use the molar mass of our product to do our last step. To go moles of product to grams of product. Right, so it could be like a hundred and hundred and sixty-five. So a hundred and ten, hundred and twelve. With the oxygen. So it was 111 plus three oxygens, it's going to be 169. So final answer. So this would be grams of product of our Grams of Fe2O3. And that's just, the, yeah. Two times the mass of iron plus three times the mass of oxygen. Say it again, Max. So it seems a little contradictory, but that our our iron toy that we left in, in the snow all winter that rusted actually gains mass over the course of the of the, the winter because it's picking up oxygen from the atmosphere, right? We don't think about gases as having mass because they're a gas. They're so much less dense than everything we're used to dealing with as a solid or liquid. But we're adding oxygen atoms in there. All right. Questions about this part so far? The most basic way I can ask, so let me. Let me pull up. the uh, practice test real quick, because I'll show you exactly how this, this is gonna look on the test. So the easiest way I can ask you a stoichiometry question is if you if I start in moles and I just give you a reaction to balance the reaction and how much product you can make. 
If you're already in moles, all you really need to do to answer these questions is this step, right? There's the, so question seven is definitely going to be a moles to moles stoichiometry question, where I give you moles, you tell me how many moles of product you're going to make. Eight or nine are going to be a little bit more interesting because I'll do something like give you a mass. If you know the mass, you have to tell me the mass of the product, right? That's what we just did here. What did we assume in this problem? <laughs> we assumed what? That there's 100 grams of iron. So you can usually assume that if I tell you something that you can take that as a, as a given. What else did we assume? Mol that's not really an assumption. We did the work to, we know that this reaction is balanced. We're assuming, I guess, the only reaction that's happening is this reaction. We're not making any iron two oxide. We're also assuming what? The amount of oxygen we have. We're assuming we're not gonna run out of oxygen. Exactly, that's where we're going. All right, so we're assuming that nothing is going to run out. If you have a starting amount of both of your reactants, you don't necessarily know which one's going to run out. But you know that you can't have, you're not likely to have both of them being used up at the exact same time, right? If you go, you know, food analogies work really well for stoichiometry. If I go to the store and I buy, you know, $20 worth of hamburger buns and 100 hamburger patties, what's going to run out first? Probably buns. Buns, you know, buns are pretty cheap, but the main point I'm trying to make is just we don't know until we actually do the calculation and we know what ratio they're being used up in, what's going to run out first, right? And so that's the whole idea behind what's called limiting the limiting reactant. The limiting reactant is just whatever runs out first, and that's gonna dictate the entire reaction. Because once you run out of one reactant, I didn't even realize it's this exact same reaction. I wasn't even planning that. I probably did at some point. Whatever's running out, dictates the entire reaction because once you run out of one of your ingredients, you can't make hamburgers anymore, right? It doesn't matter whether I run out of buns or hamburger patties. Once I run out of one of them, I can't make hamburgers. So whatever runs out first is going to dictate the rest of the reaction. So here, in our first reaction, we're assuming that we're not running out of oxygen. Is that a good assumption given the system I described? Yeah, probably. We're definitely not using up all the oxygen in the entire atmosphere for one 100 gram iron toy, right? But we are assuming that the oxygen can get there. That That's more of an engineering question or a, um, the math question. Does it wind up getting buried? If, if you've ever heard or um, heard of uh, archaeologists finding stuff in peat bogs, does anybody know what a peat bog is? Peat spelled P-E-A-T. A peat bog is basically a swamp, um, and it's it has it's a swamp that very specifically has microorganisms that that chew up all of the oxygen that gets dissolved in the water, and nothing. Um, there's basically no oxygen present at the bottom of these peat bogs, which means nothing rots or oxidizes. And so you can find things at the bottom of these peat bogs that are hundreds and thousands of years old and have not rusted yet or have not decayed yet. Um, it preserves things really, really well. So we are making the assumption here that the oxygen can actually get to our iron toy. 
for the system I described, that's probably a decent assumption though. Snow is not really airtight. Um, so we can we can make that assumption. Um, they find a lot of these, there's a lot of peat bogs in Northern Europe and in Scotland. Um, so Scotland tends to be a lot of the place they find a lot of these. Um, they do see some of them in the swamps. They're not technically peat bogs, but that there's some swamps in the American South that have similar properties where they find some stuff that's really, really, really old that should have broken down and decayed that hasn't. Peat is like the early form of coal, right? Yes. So you actually can burn peat. Yeah. It's one of the one of the earliest examples of the British Empire um, oppressing its subjects was uh, that forcing the um, Irish to work in peat farms, where they would basically dig up dried peat and cut it and sell it to burn for fuel in the in the winter to keep to keep the English from freezing. Um, the Scottish and the Irish were actually forced to in not quite slavery, but more like a feudal society. Um, to work on these uh, these peat farms where they dug this stuff up and, and um, pro provided it to the the lords of the area. All right, enough historical side notes for now. You know I can't stay on topic that long, but let's um. What's going to run out first if I just give you two moles and one mole? I give this a question in moles, the same ratio. They're going to both get used at the same time. So, these are not kind of numbers to be able to guess it in your head, right? Because they're being used up at different rates and they're not clean, like doubled rates. So the way to, to show your work for this is there's a couple of ways you can write it out. A couple of ways that are all equally valid as far as getting the right answer and getting full credit. The easiest one is basically think about it like this. I have enough burger patties to make 100 burgers, and I have enough buns to make 80 burgers. How many burgers can I make? 80. So basically, you do the, the calculations to figure out how much product you can make with each of these, and they're not going to be the same number. So two moles of iron for every four moles of iron, that's two moles of product, right? So two divided by four times two is going to give us what? One point zero moles of product. Then we do the same thing with the oxygen. 1.0 moles of oxygen, and for every three moles of oxygen, it's two moles of product. You get, that's gonna give us two thirds, right? 0 0.67, we're keeping sig figs. So what's running out first? The oxygen, why? Not just because there's less of it, because we, can, we only have enough oxygen to make 0.67 moles of product. We have enough iron to make one mole of product. They can't both be true, right? So whichever of these numbers is less must be the actual amount that you can make. It is, if I measured this out really carefully, it's possible to use up both of these at the exact same time. If you do this and you get the same number for both of these, that means they're both gonna run out at the same time. You planned your 
your barbecue very carefully. You got the buns and the meat to run out at the same time. Anybody who's ever been to a barbecue knows that that's not really how it goes, right? There's always buns left over. All right, does that way make sense? If that way didn't make sense to you, I'm gonna show another way to show the same thing. All right, so let me, let's finish this off. So if we, what's, we already decided this is what's running out first. So oxygen is our limiting reactant with these numbers. Our theoretical yield is gonna be how much product we can make. What's our theoretical yield? What's our final amount of product we can make? This number. We have enough patties to make 67 hamburgers. Therefore, we can make 67 hamburgers. All right? And that term, again, that's our theoretical yield. Yield just means how much you can make. Theoretical, because if it's assuming everything goes according to plan, you use up all of your iron and all of the oxygen possible, here's how much product you can make. All right. So here's the other way of figuring out your limiting reactants. If the first way did not make as much sense to you, this might this might make more sense. Basically, instead of figuring out how many hamburgers we can make, we're gonna use these molar ratios to figure out how much, if we have 20 patties, how many buns does that use? So instead of looking at how much product we can make, we're gonna use our mole ratio to compare reactant to reactant. So instead of saying four moles of iron makes two moles of product, we're gonna say for every four moles of iron, that's three moles of oxygen used. So how many moles of oxygen does this use? Two over four is a half times three, 1.5, I think. So if I used up all of my iron, it would use up 1.5 moles of oxygen. Do we have 1.5 moles of oxygen? That tells us what runs out first, right? This is another way of looking at the same question. Using up all the iron would use up 1.5 moles of oxygen. We don't have that. Therefore, oxygen is the limiting reactant. If I picked the other one to start with, usually you would guess, okay, I think the iron's going to run out first, and then I'm going to write this out. And I guess wrong. But you can pick either of these to start with. And they're going to show you the limiting reactants just as well. Or say, okay, I think the oxygen is going to run out first. Because for every three moles of O2, that's four moles of iron used. So one point, we're keeping accurate sig figs, 1.3 moles of iron used. Do we have 1.3 moles of iron? Yeah, we have two moles of iron. So this is showing us the exact same thing. Ox using up all of the oxygen is gonna have leftover iron. 
right? The reason that this is useful to be able to think about this in multiple ways is because there's a lot of different molar ratios we can write out, right? And they're all going to tell us different things. Landon? Exactly. That's the next, the next slide is how much excess reactants is left over. Well, using up all the oxygen means 1.3 moles of iron were used. We started with 2.0 moles of iron initially. So 0 0.7 moles of iron in excess. Excess just means left over, right? All right, so these are a little bit tricky in that they're kind of like word problems. They're kind of, they're logic problems, both in the balancing and the, are you using it up or making it? What's gonna run out first? You have to think about the, the logic for some of these to really wrap your head around it. And for whatever reason, doing this with chemicals is way more abstract and therefore way more difficult than doing this with food. We did this with food. I think everybody could do all the calculations and understand all the logic behind how many hamburger buns are left over, right? But for whatever reason, when I say how much iron, how many moles of iron is left over, everybody loses their minds, right? It's the same math, the same logic. You just have to get used to thinking about it the same yeah. way. Um, just because there's probably some places in the slides, and I will probably write it on the board at some point. Using six whole letters for excess is, is way too inefficient for chemists. So off, usually you will see excess written just as the letters XS. You see excess written like that, that means excess. Also was a it was a British new wave band from the 80s called NXS that they spell like that. There was an I, it was always this, it was always put a star, and the star was bigger than the I. Using the same same nomenclature as the chemists there. I don't think that any of them were trained chemists, but you never know. You'd be surprised. Anybody know about that, um, what's his name, Dexter from uh, The Offspring? You, everybody knows the band The Offspring. If not, you have homework. Um, punk band from the 90s and 2000s from SoCal. Uh, Dexter, the lead singer and songwriter, also has a PhD in molecular bio. A lot of, a lot of good punk bands have their, uh, their front men actually have advanced degrees. Brian May from Queen. Brian May from Queen has a PhD in astrophysics. The guy from um, from Bad Religion has a PhD in econ. Anyway. Turns out if you're if you're smart and driven enough to become famous playing music, you're also probably smart and driven enough to become you know get advanced degrees as well, if you so choose. Then again, on the other hand, you get Keith Richards who has a PhD in drugs. Consumption of, not production of. All right, last piece here. Let's say we actually did this experiment. And at the very end, we actually measured 0 0.5 moles. Uh, rust was produced. What's the percent yield? So percent yield is basically how much did you get divided by how much were you supposed to get? So I already erased it because we were doing 
um, all this on top of each other. The theoretical yield here was what? Zero point six seven moles. So that's if everything went perfectly. we would get 0.67 moles of rust. We actually only got 0.5 moles of rust. What's our percent yield? The part divided by the total times 100. But percentage is always, and I'll say that again, because this is a little bit of a specific case. Percentage in general is always part over total times 100. In terms of yield, percent yield, it's the actual yield. What did you actually get over the theoretical yield times 100? So this is actually really similar to your grade. Your grade in the class is how many points did you actually get divided by how many points could you have gotten times 100, right? Percent yield is just like a grade. So here's our actual divided by our theoretical times 100. Sig big still apply to percentages, right? So two sig figs and two sig figs. The 100 is exact, so 75%. You, if you really were so inclined, you can actually do this by hand and by taking these and putting them in um, fractions and doing the division. Not a bad way to remember how division of fractions works. So one half divided by Two thirds, the same as one half times three over two, which is three over four. Turns out math still works even when you're in a science class. All right, so doing all of those together is what's called a reaction study. Here's your reaction. Here's your initial amounts of everything. Here's your actual yield. Calculate all of these relevant numbers. What's gonna run out first? How much is of your leftover, of your excess is gonna be leftover? How much product could you make? What's your percent yield? It's a lot of steps. Each of them is its own problem, really, right? They're all related. So don't get too bogged down and figure out. Just start with figure out what's going to run out first. Once you know what's going to run out first, you can figure out what's left over and theoretical yield. All right. I'm going to let you all work on this in small groups for just take like five or 10 minutes, work on this. I want everybody to try and work your way through this and then we'll work through it again as a class. Okay.
So, if you the, and that's that's the best place to start with this, right? Like I said, when you get one of these problems, first thing you want to do is start getting all those grams. Just put them in the molds. Oh, so we. Yeah, so take 0.72 grams of zinc, figure out how many moles of zinc. Yeah, so you're just going to use the periodic table, right? Because zinc has a molecular weight 65.38 that, right? That means that we know if you have 0 0.72 grams, for every 65 grams, that's one mole of zinc. That's, that's how we're going to get everything into moles. Is just start by using the collectible weight. Right? And then you can say, okay, well, 1.42 grams of silver. For every well, silver is 100. For every mole of matter. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then you can do the same thing if it's more than one thing in the compound. You're just going to add all the pieces together. So if silver is 107, whatever grams, you're going to say, okay, two times 107 plus the mass of oxygen is going to be what you're going to use for the bottom part. So since there's two silver, exactly. So we're going to take all of the pieces, making it two. Exactly. So because for every one mole of this whole compound, we have two moles of silver and one oxygen. Oh no! So we just take all the pieces. And a yeah, so there's the two here. So that makes it so the two in front here doesn't change the mass of the silver. So it's it still just going to be the one of seven. So if it's already like compound, if it's like more than one of the silver, we should multiply it by two. But right. balancing, we want to change. Oh, the balancing doesn't affect the molecular weight. Okay. So, it's, so the, the subscripts affect the molecular weight. Well, why does it affect that? Yeah, it's like two of them. Does the number of hamburgers I make affect the weight of the hamburger? So, so it's abstract, it's tricky. I, that was the next, the first point I was going to make when we come back together, because I, you're not the only one who had that question. Just out of you and Stuart, both of you immediately had that question, right? Yeah. So. So it's the oxygen is part of the molecular weight. I feel like if it's a one to one ratio, the mole of product is going to be a theoretical two. But you don't know what's running out first yet. So, and then you do the same thing there. Whichever one of those numbers follow you, is a theoretical two. And that will also
Usually, when we do a reaction, like it's one product, we care more about the other. Oh, so we're just ignoring. We're going to ignore the zinc oxide. But that's not what we actually measure. Okay. That's clear up what you're going to do with the next thing. Yeah, 
Silver Yeah. 
Okay, you're gonna do the same exact thing now, but you're gonna look like you're silver. So like you have zero two nine molar silver. Okay, so you have the ratio between. Silver oxide and silver. Wait a minute, I know how to. Oh, yeah, it's just random, right? Okay, so you have that. I mean, the same as the other one. Okay, so I'll talk about this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. You can get this much silver, and with this much silver oxide, you can make this much silver. So, which one makes less silver? Therefore, your is your limiting reaction. They can't limit reaction because it means less. So that takes care of the first one. Which one's going to be your next step? Yeah, your uh, silver oxide. Make sure you're ready. Right now, you're going to be here. All right, everybody. That's your excess. Let's just once again, let's start working through this. Okay. So, what are the first two things we do when we get it get a problem like this? Convert to moles. Yeah. And and balance it. So balance agreed. Everybody got here, right? Yeah. Just getting the moles. Make sure you we're just getting that off the periodic table, right? So more sig figs probably because your eyes are better or you have a periodic table sitting in front of you. But your molecular weights are just coming from the from the periodic table. So you get 0 0.011 moles of zinc. How many how many moles of the silver oxide do we get? I think the molecular weight's about 232, two silvers and an oxygen. I got 0 0.012. Right, 2.75 divided by 232. 231.7. Seven three. Yes. Yeah, so far, so far more like seven. Right. So our two hundred thirty one point seven three is two silvers and one oxygen. So silver is one hundred and seven point nine plus one hundred and seven point nine plus fifteen point nine 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 or sixteen, depending on what table you have. A lot going on, but at the very least, we can start by getting rid of grams, so we don't need to think in grams anymore. So that's going to make life easier. What do we get for our final number for silver? 1.42 divided by 107.9 is 0.013. 0 0.013? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay, everybody good on molecular weights? Yeah. Okay, key point. The coefficient, when you balance it, doesn't change the molecular weight. Okay, because it doesn't matter how many hamburgers you can make, one hamburger weighs the same thing, right? No matter how many you're making. So that two doesn't affect the molecular weight of silver. The subscripts of the compound, those affect the molecular weight using two slices of cheese instead of one is going to affect the weight of your cheeseburger, right? But once you have your ratio 
it doesn't matter how many you make, every cheeseburger weighs the same. Okay. Now that we have everything in moles, we don't need to think about grams anymore. Especially since this problem doesn't say anything about what units here, which means you can give me theoretical yield in moles. You don't need to find theoretical yield or excess yield or percent yield in grams. Once we're in moles, unless I specifically say how many grams are left or how many grams did you make, answering in moles is a totally valid answer. So, and getting it in moles actually makes figuring out, in this case, makes figuring out the limiting reagent really easy, right? How do we know what the limiting reactant is? If we have a balanced reaction, we have everything in moles. Whatever, if they're being used up at the same rate, whatever you have fewer moles of. We have 0 0.011 moles of zinc and 0 0.012 moles of, of silver oxide. Therefore, we're going to run out of zinc first. So that makes zinc the limiting reactant. Also makes excess reactant pretty easy too, right? How do we figure out excess reactant? Whatever's going to be left over, right? We're using up all of our zinc. And we're going to have a little bit of this left over. So, and the way we can show our work for that is, okay, if we have 0 0.011 moles of zinc, every time we use up one mole of zinc, we're going to use up one mole of silver oxide. So if they're being used up at the same ratio, the same rate, that means that this is just one over one mathematically. Landon? Because, because we wind up with both of these being, when we put them in moles, and when our balanced reaction, we look at our balanced reaction, everything has a one in front of it except for our silver, right? So we're using up ours for every one mole of zinc that gets used. We're also using one mole of zinc of the silver oxide because both of these have a one in front of them. All right. So if it's not a one to one ratio, you might not be able to just look at it and see what's going to run out first. If that's the case, you just do this. You use those molar ratios to figure out what's going to be used up. So that's going to give us 0 0.011 moles of Ag2O used. We have more than that. So how much is going to be left over? Yeah, we're just going to do subtraction. We know we've got 0 0.012. We're going to use 0.011. 0 0.001 moles silver oxide excess. If I asked you to put it in grams, you would then just use the molecular weight to go back to grams once you get it in moles. But that part's easy, right? Or relatively we're working on making it feel easy, even if we're not there yet. So we're halfway done. We answered the first question, right? Limiting reactant. And we showed our work for that by saying with this line here. We answered the second question. Here's our excess. How do we answer theoretical yield? if everything went perfectly, right? That's why we call it the theoretical yield. If we use up all of our zinc and everything goes perfectly, we can say, okay, 0 0.011 moles of zinc, 
And for every one mole of zinc, that's two moles of silver. So our theoretical yield is 0 0.022 moles. Once we get there, percent yield, already on the board. Our actual is 0 0.013, our theoretical is 0 0.022. So it's gonna be something like 55, 60%. All right, more practice on this to come. I know that this one felt rough because this is the first one where I gave you all of this as just a blank sheet of paper. More practice to come. Let me just the groundwork. It's not that it was easy, it's just that you already put in the effort and that makes it feel a little easier. <laughs> Yeah, I <laughs> 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 